hide your face from us. Turn not your servants away in anger. Do not forsake us, O God, of our salvation. The prophet Isaiah writes, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, where he will abundantly pardon. The Lord is near to you. He has drawn near in the person of Jesus Christ, whose death and resurrection brings forgiveness and brings life and salvation. And as a calm ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now my head shall be lifted up. I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, since we cannot stand before you relying on anything we have done, help us trust in your abiding grace. I live according to your word through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now. You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading, 5 verses 6 through 9, that he may have compassion and be found. Call on him, wicked, forsake their ways, and let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. Freely pardon. Neither are your ways, Lord. As the heavens are, are my ways higher than your than your thoughts. This is the, uh, the epistle was from Philippians chapter and nineteen through thirty. Contending now. I that what has happened to, to advance the gospel has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to every change for Christ. And the rest of the brothers and sisters have been and dare all the more of fear. For I know this, and God's provision of this has happened to me will turn. I eagerly expect and be ashamed. But we'll, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body or by death. For to me, I is gain. If I, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what between the two, I desire which is better by far for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, and I will continue with all the joy in the faith, so that your boasting in Christ Jesus on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct your same gospel of Christ. Then to you or only hear about you in my absence, I will in the one spirit, as one for the faith of the gospel in any way, by the this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but they have by God. For it is after Christ, not only also to suffer for him. The same struggle you saw I have, still have. This is the word of The Holy Gospel chapter. For the kingdom of God is like a now early in the morning to hire workers for his free to pay them a denarius for the work that about nine in the morning others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. Also go in, in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And about three in the afternoon he did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing as hired us the answer, he said to them, When the evening came, the woman called the workers and paid them their wages, beginning with the last of the first. The workers who were hired about five denarius. So when those came who were who received more, but each one of them also received a grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last were only you have made them equal to us who have bore the burden of the work and the heat of the but he answered one of them, Didn't you agree to work for your pay and go? I want to give the one who was hired last the same. I have the right to do what I want. Or are you envious because I am generous? 
to the last we last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you as we sing our children's song, Jesus loves me, for our children's message.
take entire orphanages, orphanages and go to the baseball game. And when the new sit at the radio on Sunday morning and read the Sunday front, Sunday went to the night courts. And there uh, he dismissed the judge of the night he see. I'll serve as the judge. And uh, this was in the poorest ward. And then in a few minutes, one of his first cases was a tattered old woman who was brought forth charged with stealing a loaf of bread from a store. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her, her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving, and she, and she didn't know what else to do. So she stole that loaf of bread, but the refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor, he said to teach others around here a lesson. We go out all five foot four just did a big sign. And he turned to the woman and said, I have to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced sentence, what did he do? He already had reached his pocket and pulled out a ten dollar bill. And he tossed it into the hat saying, here's the $10 fine, which I now remit. But furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this place 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that their grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. On that day, they collected $47.50. Was sent over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Fifty cents of the amount being contributed by the red-faced grocery store owner. And while some seventy pounds of New York policemen, each of whom had just paid fifty cents, they stood and gave the mayor a standing ovation. And here's the question: Did the elderly lady in the story get what she deserved? But the answer is, of course not. She had stolen a loaf of bread. Yes, she may have had reason, but stealing is stealing, and regardless of the reason, reason 
today. But what we see in this story is again grace. Grace is when one is in superior power shows kindness or mercy to one in lesser position. And Mary Guardia, rather than demanding punishment for the woman herself, paid the fine and then further helped her cause with the collection of 50 cents and gave from each individual present that night, gave that money to her. It was much more than she deserved, but still all about grace. And that's what our gospel lesson today is all about. It's all about grace. We come to this parable of the workers in the vineyard. And it can be a difficult parable. We don't like the parable because often we say it's unfair. And in this parable, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner owner who went out and he hired workers for his vineyard. And so he hired them early in the day and telling them that he would pay them the usual wage or the denarius. He went back at various different times of the day and found more workers waiting to be hired. And each time he hired those, and he told them that they were to pay what was right. Now we're not told why some had not found a worker if they had shown up at the marketplace late or those details, and they really don't matter. But at the day end of the day, he came to pay the workers, and he began with the ones most recently hired, and he paid them a full day's wage. And of course, that excited those that had been working all day. They thought, boy, oh, we're going to be double paid today. Wouldn't that be excellent? But their excitement was short-lived. In fact, they became pretty upset when they got the same pay of working all day as those who only worked an hour. When the landlord heard that grumbling, and they grumbled a lot, just like we would grumble, he tried to explain that he was not unfair at all. He gave them what they had agreed upon. It was his money, and he could be generous if he wanted to. We're not told how many workers responded to his comment. It would seem that the landowner did not know much about business. And but the next time he went to hire somebody in the morning, he probably would say, no, I'll wait till the last hour. But what the landlord did no, was what grace was all about. And the workers that came at the end of that day did not get what they deserved. They got mercy. And mercy is always at the heart of grace. Of course, in the parable, the landowner is God and the workers are us. And the pay is none other than the kingdom of heaven. And as we say this parable, we can quickly see it truly is all about grace. God's pay scale is not based on personal accomplishments or hard work, but always based on love. And God in his mercy promises us a reward, and that reward that we all seek is eternal salvation, eternal life. And it's something that we can't earn. No matter how hard we try, it's always and always will be a free gift. Paul in Romans 4 puts it this way. It is therefore the promise is by faith that it might become to us as a free gift by grace, so that the promise might be sure to all descendants, not only to those who live by the law, but also to those who believe as Abraham did. God makes those rewards available to all. He doesn't say it. it's only for you and not for you. His rewards are available through faith in Christ Jesus. And he set up the system so that everyone that believes in him, believes in the only begotten Son, would not perish, but would have everlasting life. The main reason this reward system seems so unfair is that we have no control over it. And that's something we don't like. We want to control everything. We want to dictate what's going to happen. We can't work hard and receive our rewards because Christ did it all for us. He paid the price that we could never pay. He gave up his very life on the cross in order for us to receive all of God's promised rewards. And that greatest reward of all is eternal life. However, God does not stop here. You see, he set up a system so that it is not dependent on us having to come to him. 
But God always comes to us. Think about that. Just as in this parable, the Lord invites us into his kingdom. He does it each and every day. He comes out and he recruits us. Some of us were recruited early when we were baptized as infants. And we became one of God's children. For others, it took God coming to us a little later in life. For others, it will, it will take God until the 11th hour to bring them into the kingdom. But nevertheless, we will be there. Why? Because God made that promise to us. And he never, ever gives up on us. He has called us by his grace to be his own. Whether we are the first or the last, we all receive the same reward, eternal life. So is this fair? Not in our mind, it isn't. But God's ways, as it tells us in Isaiah, are not his way, our ways. And for those whom God has called, this message of faith is the power that saves and the wisdom of salvation. The message of faith is that Christ loved us so much that he literally stretched out his arms, and he did on that cross. And he died there for our sins. And God chose his grace in the form of his own son, who has redeemed us with his precious blood. There is no other way. If you were to ask people to define the word of grace, we would probably get 10 different answers from 10 different people. Because for some, grace is a total mystery. But for Christians, it's the reason that we are saved. Or it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. We know that verse. But one definition that sums up what grace really means is undeserved love. This is what God has shown us. An undeserved love. We didn't earn it, but he gave it to us anyway. Because instead of turning his back on us and walking away, which he could and he should, he called us to be his own. He went out and he invites us to work in his vineyard. He calls us to be a part of his kingdom. And the selection of workers in Jesus' parable was as unpredictable as life itself. Although we may proudly assert that all people are born equal, there is no denying that we are not all equally born. Some of us are born into money and comfort, but many more of us are not. Some of us are born with grace and strength of athletes, but many of us are not. Some of us are born with physical disabilities and mental disabilities, and every day is a challenge, and some of us have intellect and that stretch and soar, but many of us do not. Some of us get picked on the first round through the marketplace, but many of us don't. In fact, any one of us may suddenly find ourselves alone and unclean in the eleventh hour of our lives. And that's why we are all, and I guess we could say, we are all eleventh hour people. Grateful for the enduring promises and presence of a very just God. But dependent upon the compassion and generosity of our merciful God, mercy is uniquely Christian. It's Christ, in Christianity, in the presence of Christ's sacrifice, in the shadow of the cross, mercy became not a weakness, but a strength and a signpost. The word for sin is hamatia. It literally means missing the mark. Anyone here hit the bullseye every time that you wouldn't shoot at a target? I don't think so. And if you miss the mark, mercy's not an option. In this case, mercy would be an imperative. But what do we say about our God? Our God is just. But our God is also merciful. And both qualities define this all-powerful God that we've come before this morning. And then even if you look at Jesus' own 11th hour, it was mercy that reigned. Because there, as Jesus hung on the cross, despite the dysfunction of his disciples, he still had companions, one on his left and one on his right. Suffering for their cross on their crosses. They were convicted thieves. They were yet Jesus is called for the neighbors. One taught him and dismissed him when we see what he did to him. But the other first started that way and then he changed his mind, didn't he? And he decided he was getting what he deserved. And in contrition he asked Jesus to remember. He says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus promise that crucified criminal? 
He said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. The very last human being to speak with the earthly Jesus was a convicted criminal. And why should a thief be offered this? Why should he be offered a get out of free jail card? Why should an executed criminal get a, cop, a clean slate? It's called grace. Because Jesus called as the roommate is the poster boy for deathbed confessions. And yet Jesus extends to this man the fullness of God's mercy. And Jesus promises the crucified thief, this last hour faith follower, that he would be the first. Ever think about that? He was the first in your paradise with him. The eleventh hour laborers, the thief on the cross, the prodigal son, who deserved nothing, yet received the fatted calf, the golden ring, and the father's love. They all are examples for us this morning of God's kingdom. They are all testimonies to the strength and power of God's justice and God's mercy and God's grace. And sometimes when we see God do something cruel for someone else, we kind of get upset. We completely forget about his goodness that he has given to us. And we accuse him of being unfair. So how do we keep this from happening? How do we keep from grumbling with envy against the generosity of God to others? How do we keep from getting upset when God in his goodness allows the first to be last? The laborers were satisfied as long as they focused on the denarius and the work they were given. But as soon as he knows what others were getting, that's when they got ugly. And so this is what I recommend if you're filled with envy. Find a quiet place. Be alone. Confess it to God. Tell him where you're, you're sorry for being envious. But sometimes you wonder why things are the way they are. And two, take out a piece of paper and write down all the ways God has blessed your life this past week. I was doing that this morning and I got a long list very quickly. It surprised me. But now I want you to make that list so I'll start thanking God for each one personally. And one thing will happen. Your envy will leave because it's impossible to be grateful and envious at the same time. Count your blessings one by one. We all have been told that many times. My grandmother finished that a, a little differently. She said, Count your blessings one by one, and the green eyed monster will be gone for good. First Thessalonians 5 15, 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you, Christ Jesus. As long as you concentrate on praising Jesus, as long as you concentrate on working in this vineyard, nothing else matters. And if you understand that he has given you a ministry and that he's always rewarded you out of his generous goodness, you will be satisfied, whatever it might be. God doesn't reward people based on the number of hours we work, but he rewards us on the abundance of his grace. Maybe you're thinking, I'd love to work in God's vineyard, but I'm not really good at anything. Yes, you are. Because when you think God can't use you, just look at the Bible. Look at some of the guys and people that he used. Abraham was too old by our standards. Moses had a stuttering problem, he had become one of the greatest leaders. Elijah had him suffer from depression, and mental illness. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Right? Martha was a warrior. Zacchaeus was too small. Timothy had an ulcer. Lazarus was even dead. And the list goes on and on and on. So I guess what I'm saying is, there's no more excuses. No one, not a one of us has any more, has any excuses for not serving the Lord. So reach up to the Lord Jesus Christ and accept his offer of employment and his eternal life insurance. It will be the best thing 
that has ever happened to you. And great things will happen because of it. And remember this, it's all about grace. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of Christ which passes on you in understanding. Keep our hearts and our minds in the true faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Let us stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We speak the creed together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, Son of God, and of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of life, very God of very God, the God and not me, in the substance of the Father, in all things for me, before us men and for our salvation, and now from heaven, and was the of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And ascend into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come with him in his own way to judge both the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, he is spoken by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the mission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We will be seated as we bring our offerings to the Lord at this time.
Make us to know your ways, O Lord. That we may walk in the path of salvation made known in your word. Hear our complaints and quiet them by your merciful deliverance. That we may respond with trust and thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. Encourage us, O Lord, by your Holy Spirit. That we may not lose heart, but but being of one mind and one will. May serve you with gladness, doing the works of your kingdom and speaking your word of witness throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. And help us, O Lord, to hold fast to your word and bless us with faithful pastors who will preach and teach your eternal gospel, that we may rejoice in doing your will. We continue to ask for your guidance and direction and blessing as we continue with the calling process here at Holy Cross. And in the meantime, Lord, continue to work in all of us as we continue with the message of your grace. And may be all may and may your kingdom grow. Lord in your mercy. Amen. Almighty Lord bless this nation and all people in their rightful callings. Grant that we may serve our neighbors in love and that all authorities would exercise their callings with humanity and wisdom on behalf of the defenseless. Lord in your mercy. Amen. And loving God, we thank you for the gift of health. Hear our prayers on behalf of the sick, the aged, the infirm, and the mourning. Today we especially pray for those trying to still recover from the impact of the floods in Libya. We pray for those recovering from surgery, namely Connie Jordan and Pat Ricks. For those dealing with cancer and waiting more treatment, Dennis Plant, Sherry Moe, Shannon Penman. We continue to pray for little Noah Peterson as this week she'll be hospitalized while going through more testing for three days. For the mother of Raj Polly, and we thank, ask the Lord to continue to give her strength. Continue to be with Millie DeSante, Julie Naren, Dan Davidson, David Bino, Tim Sprinkle, Ron Sebesh, Shabrisha, Winston Benjamin, Maggie Hoffman, Clifford, uh, Ricks, and Jack. And all of this we need in our hearts. Grant them healing in accord with your will and grant your grace to sustain them in their need. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And remember, O oh Lord, those who receive your true body and blood from this altar. Prepare us to receive them worthily in repentance and faith for the forgiveness of our sins and the healing of our bodies. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. A merciful Lord, grant that in Christ we may seek you while you may be found and call upon you while you are near, forsaking all wicked ways and unrighteous thoughts. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we command all for whom we pray. Trust in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, the table has been set, and the Lord invites us to come. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly really good and bright and sorry to that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. For the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. And because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all believing him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. And therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we long and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Supper, give it to him, saying, Drink of it all of you. This is my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as God's people, we now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We join us as you God this day.
Accompany us with the news of your gracious invitation, that whoever calls on the name, your name, shall be saved. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. In two, in a couple of weeks, first slide. Uh, there'll be all Sundays, October 15th. And following that Sunday, there'll be a rec- uh, kind of a gathering of international foods. And uh, it's a time for us to just do it like the old fashioned potlucks. And when the main meal or uh, main entrees are going to be served, and if you want to bring a cultural cuisine, cuisine or dessert or a little side, uh, just do it that way. Uh, bring it along to help. But it's just a fellowship time. And we don't do enough of that fellowship, and we encourage you to be a part of it. And the next slide is Candy Drive. Yay! We all like candy. And what we're going to do as a church, we'll be collecting candy to donate to the school's fall festival. Uh, if you're able to donate, please turn the candy to Rachel by October 15th. And we're asking uh, the sons we have a number of children with peanut allergies. There are no nuts in the in the trees. And I think that'll pay everybody to take care of it. And so it's great seeing all of you this morning. May you have a blessed week. And we close with a ma- uh, amazing grace. Oh, wait, 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 stop. We got something else going on. with our closing song. Grace the Lord.
Thank you.